Today's video is another installment of the Ask Health Wealth series, where a viewer of mine asked me the question if I can explain a little bit more about the clinical uses and applications of uh, stem cells. And I will include actually the distinction between embryonic stem cells and so-called induced pluripotent stem cells. Although I have a PhD in biomedical engineering and over 17 years of working experience in the healthcare industry, I do not intend to give you investment advice. Please consider your own risk profile before making any investments and research your investments wisely. In this video, I will not be discussing any particular companies specifically who are working in this uh, research area, trying to develop cures using stem cells of various kinds. But I intend this video to be more an overview of a the history of uh, stem cells, as well as an overview of the landscape of the current clinical research that involves uh, induced pluripotent stem cells for various uh, disease indications and see where this technology uh, currently is at. So let's first dive into the history and the origin on stem cell research. The first publication goes back to 1961 when Ernest uh, Till and James McCulloch published the first paper that uh, indicated the notion that there are such cells as stem cells. As it often happens in medical research, the initial discoveries and early work are done on animal tissues, in this case predominantly on mouse-derived uh, stem cells, before then later on discoveries are translated or applied basically using human cells later on. And in fact, it would take until 1998 when the first human embryonic-derived stem cells were actually isolated. And they were isolated from in vitro fertilized um, embryos, which were not implanted in the womb of a woman. And of course, it doesn't take much imagination to anticipate that the ethical issues around using and employing, even obtaining embryonic stem cells is wrought with a lot of uh, issues and problems. And this is why research has quickly actually continued and we managed to produce so-called pluripotent stem cells, uh, which were though not derived anymore from the origin of embryonic uh, human tissues. It was actually in 2006 that two Japanese researchers uh, published the first paper demonstrating that it is possible to convert skin fibroblasts, and these are cells that have already differentiated into becoming basically precursor skin cells, they managed to turn those into uh, stem cells and they called those stem cells then induced pluripotent stem cells. So then next, let's cover some of the terminology and the explanations of what these cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells, are actually capable of. A cell that is described as a so-called pluripotent stem cell must have two very distinct properties. On the one hand, it is the ability to eternally self-renew. That is, the cells can divide, make identical copies of themselves, of course, in the appropriate cell culture medium, which provides the nourishment, the energy, and so on for the cells to actually survive. But it is the ability to indefinitely reproduce identical copies of itself which is the definition of the self-renewal. The other part of the definition of a pluripotent stem cell is basically its ability to turn into any other cell type in the human or animal uh, body for that matter. So in that sense, the stem cell is really the most fundamental biological building block, the precursor from which every single cell type in the uh, animal or human body is derived. When you consider the development of a, an embryo in the uterus, uh, initially, of course, there are only two cells, the egg and the sperm that fuse. And well, from this so-called blastocyst, all of the different tissues, think heart muscle, think skin, think of the retina in the eye, the digestive tract, 
All of those are very specialized cells, which though all originate and derived from the very early uh, cells that are the origin of everything, and that is the stem cell. The ability to develop so-called induced pluripotent stem cells has certainly made it a lot easier and with a lot less ethical issues to conduct research and to try and develop treatment modalities using these so-called induced pluripotent stem cells. And as a side note, just for completion's sake, I'd like to mention that there is one additional unique opportunity in every person's life where stem cells can relatively easily be obtained, and that is at birth. Stem cells can be obtained from the blood that is in the umbilical cord, the so-called cord blood. And this has uh, spun into quite an industry, I would say around the globe, where parents can decide to have the cord blood actually stored and being processed to extract the stem cells contained in it, which can then be frozen in liquid nitrogen and preserved in case for future uh, use or need for any type of tissue replacement therapies, as for sure the clinical research and medical advances that can utilize those cells uh, advance. The key advantage for the child that has their stem cells stored from cord blood is that these are readily available in case of need. They are autologous, meaning that there is no issue with regards to host versus uh, graft um, rejection. And because these cells are true, unique stem cells from the beginning, there is no processing that was needed in order to convert more mature cells back into their induced pluripotent stem cell state. And therefore, any concerns about uh, toxicity or tumor genicity with these types of stem cells are actually not existent. Regarding the use of stem cells derived from cord blood, please note that you would never use your own cells to treat, for instance, um, leukemia or lymphoma for that matter, because of the severe likelihood that the disease, the blood cancer that you obtained, could be a result of a genetic uh, propensity for this type of disease. So in those cases, you would have to rely on stem cells or a bone marrow transplant from another donor. You would never use your own cells for that. So next, let's take a look at the landscape of clinical trials that are using induced pluripotent stem cells for various different disease indications and treatment modalities. In their September 2021 research paper, researchers Kim, Nam and Yu have done an excellent overview detailing which kinds of clinical trials are currently ongoing using induced pluripotent stem cells. These researchers have conducted a literature search of all the different trials that are listed in the clinicaltrials.gov database as well as the International Clinical Trials Registry platform and other sources in order to have a comprehensive overview of the different clinical trials that are currently ongoing. Even though induced pluripotent stem cells hold a tremendous clinical potential, it remains somewhat strange and surprising that the number of clinical trials that are truly aimed at interventional therapeutic clinical trials using these cells is still relatively small. In fact, the first round of literature search for such clinical trials, which was concluded in January 2021, had 137 different trials listed. And applying further filtering criteria, in the end, only 81 clinical trials remained to be eligible in the inclusion in this analysis. Furthermore, these 81 ongoing clinical trials are split into 62 which are non-therapeutic and 19 which are actually therapeutic in nature. And in this context, non-therapeutic actually means that induced pluripotent stem cells are used in a way to actually study disease progression or to understand better how a disease is actually formed, where these cells are used uh, ex vivo in order to learn more about disease progression. And this, of course, is in contrast to the therapeutic trials, which actually implant induced pluripotent stem cells into the patient with the hopes of inducing a therapeutic, and that is a treatment response. And here's a quick overview from this publication, which indicates over which types of organs or disease areas, basically these induced pluripotent stem cells can be useful and are actually being used in part of clinical trials. The therapeutic clinical trials 
aim to target the nervous system, the respiratory system, the eye, for instance, as well as the heart or the circulatory system, as well as blood disorders. As we had previously discussed on this channel about CAR T cells, you have to distinguish the so-called autologous or allogeneic uh, induced pluripotent stem cells as well. In fact, in these clinical trials, in the therapeutic 19 clinical trials, there were four that are using autologous induced pluripotent stem cells, so those ones that are derived from the own patient, versus uh, 15 which are allogeneic, meaning that the induced pluripotent stem cells come actually from a donor, not the patient themselves. Since induced pluripotent stem cells first have been introduced to the world in 2006, many researchers believe that they hold tremendous promise in terms of providing treatment options not previously available to treat various diseases. Furthermore, these cells can be combined with biomaterials in order to uh, develop and derive new tissue structures in ways that have also not previously been possible. So you may wonder, what are actually the current challenges that hold back the widespread adoption of induced pluripotent stem cells to treat even a wider variety of diseases and patients? One of the challenges is the time it takes to generate induced pluripotent stem cells. Another is the efficiency with which cells can be coaxed into becoming induced pluripotent stem cells. And then we have the remaining issues of graft versus host um, rejection in case they are allogeneic uh, stem cells and also tumor genicity is still a reasonably high concern in the medical field because of course we want to prevent that the very process of how stem cells are actually obtained or more mature cells are converted back to an induced pluripotent stem cell that this has some genetic alterations alongside with it which may make those cells more prone to actually uh, form tumors in later stages. The majority of the therapeutic clinical trials that are actually really in the clinic are either in clinical phases 1 and 2, and many of which are also in preclinical phases still. This just shows that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done before induced pluripotent stem cell derived treatments actually can reach the patients in masses. So if we contrast CRISPR-Cas technology versus treatments derived from induced pluripotent stem cells, there are a number of interesting different concepts to keep in mind. As I had mentioned previously, induced pluripotent stem cells have the ability to form any tissue type in the human body. As such, these cells are prone to actually create new tissues, in other words, replace diseased tissues in the human body. For instance, a heart attack leading to part of the heart muscle actually being weak and diseased and therefore not being able to actually pump the blood appropriately, it could be envisioned that stem cells could actually, well, replace the diseased myocardium and as such basically renew those parts of the heart muscle that are diseased. Also, currently sickle cell disease is very often treated with a bone marrow transplant. So here the aim is to replace the bone marrow which has the wrong genetic code therefore does not make the right form of hemoglobin then by new cells which have the correct genetic information and will then once infused into the patient actually form new bone marrow from which then blood is created that does no longer produce a wrong form of hemoglobin. Now we have also discussed on this channel the various CRISPR-Cas uh, modalities that are also aimed at uh, treating sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia for that matter. And those CRISPR-Cas approaches are uh, not aiming to fully replace the bone marrow, but basically are aiming at uh, inducing the formation or the stronger formation of the fetal form of hemoglobin, which is the right shape. And while well, that is done through a genetic um, edit and modification of these cells. Likewise, CRISPR-Cas technology can also be applied to induced pluripotent stem cells, and that is to mainly drive the host versus graft uh, rejection down. In other words, CRISPR-Cas9 can be used in order to 
uh, modify genetic markers and genetic information that the patient's immune system uses in order to recognize foreign cells which otherwise would be attacked and destroyed. Now to wrap up here is a list from the publication I have been discussing that uh, provides names of companies which are currently working on induced pluripotent stem cell therapies. As always I leave a link to the publication and any other references used in this video in the description below. And if you're interested for me to make a video on a particular company from this list, please let me know in the comments below. I'll be glad to look into that. I hope this video provided you with some useful information for your investment journey. If you enjoyed this kind of content, please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel for more content like this.